everybody. I'm Luna. Welcome back to Luna Eye. For over a year, workers at an Amazon warehouse in Bessemer, Alabama, have been fighting to form a union with the hopes of improving conditions and initiating collective bargaining with the third largest corporation in the world. Unfortunately, the unionization attempt failed, which is a huge surprise when you consider that the workers trying to form the union were just a bunch of poor, mostly plug and POC people. And Amazon makes more money every year than the GDP of about 150 countries. In all seriousness, it broke my heart to see those workers get defeated by Amazon, especially because Amazon got away with so many dirty and illegal chicks to keep Bessemer workers from forming a union. Sadly, union membership has been declining in the USA since 1954, and unions are far less relevant in most rich Western countries today than they were 50 years ago. A lot of this is because capitalist bourgeois democracies do everything they can to weaken unions across Europe and North America. But interest in union has been growing lately, at least in my audience, and I got questions every week from all over the world about unions and labor rights here in Vietnam. So today, let's talk about labor and unions in Vietnam, starting with the history. As you know, colonialist France came to Vietnam for the first time in the 19th century. They opened many coal mines, factories, and industrial zones and railways and forced farmers to leave their villages to come to labor for French colonial interests. By 1914, right before World War I, we had about 100,000 industrial workers in Vietnam. In truth, these workers were treated as slaves by the French colonialists, who would beat Vietnamese workers to death if they refused to work or were too sick to work. The working conditions were horrible and thousands of our workers died every year from French mistreatment. Or if they dared to resist their colonial masters, if they had a police and prison wardens. After World War I, France ramped up their exploitation to make up for what they lost in the war. In 1922, there were about 220,000 industrial workers in Vietnam working almost exclusively for French colonial interests. Because of terrible working conditions, every year, thousands of workers tried to quit their job, went on strike, and demanded higher salaries and better treatment. In the late 1920s, thanks largely to the work of Ho Chi Minh, Marxism Leninism began spreading rapidly throughout Vietnam, which greatly strengthened the workers' movement and resolved for radical change among the Vietnamese working class. To give you an idea, in 1927, we only had seven workers' strikes. But in 1930, we had 30 workers' strikes with 32,000 workers participating. The very first union of Vietnam, the Red Union, was established in 1921 and was founded by Tôn Đức Thắng, who would later become vice president for Ho Chi Minh and then acting president after Ho Chi Minh died in 1969. The Red Union began in one small factory in the south, but throughout the 20s, more Red Unions spread across Vietnam along with Marxism-Leninism. In 1929, these unions joined together to form the North Vietnam Zero Red Union. This signified the entry of Vietnamese workers into the global struggle for liberation from capitalism and colonialism and marked a new era for revolutionary strategy and class consciousness in Vietnam. By 1939, there were about 120,000 workers who were union members, at least a third of all workers. During World War II, France and Japan worked together and exploited Vietnam even more. Are you noticing a pattern here? They took everything they could and brought all of them back to their respective motherlands. Millions of Vietnamese died of starvation and preventable disease at that time, and it was one of the most brutal periods in Vietnamese history. On a personal note, both of my grandparents had to live through that period. They were both children at that time. My grandfather grew to be a very tiny man, and when my grandmother died and she was cremated, her bones were reduced to powder, which doesn't usually happen in our cremation process, and it was because of her lack of childhood nutrition. In 1940, the Zero Wrath Union reformed into the National Salvation Workers Association. Members of this union were the ones who broke into rice storehouses of fascist Japan and distributed rice to poor Vietnamese people, which made communism very popular in Vietnam and contributed greatly to the great victory of the Communist Revolution of Vietnam in the August 1945. The workers' union kept playing a very important role in our resistance against colonialist France and later the war against the imperialist USA. 
Union members worked closely and came to live with workers and farmers all across North and South Vietnam to teach them class consciousness and Marxist-Leninist theory. These union members risked their lives to build a national worker movement, even though the public government in the South tried by all means to stop and crush them. In 1946, the National Salvation Workers Association's name was changed to the Vietnam General Confederation of Labor. In the resistance against France from 1946 to 1954, union members from all over Vietnam helped with building resistance bases and moving weapons and machines. In 1950, we had about 241,000 union members. After the Diet Bien Phu victory, the north of Vietnam was free and we tried to build a socialist society while also preparing for the threat of war from the United States. North Vietnamese unions now had a new mission. They focused on building factories to produce machines and weapons for the nation's self-defense. They also began offering education programs to teach other workers how to read and write and new trade skills as well as Marxist-Leninist theory. At that time, Vietnam's union also had connections with many international unions from all over the world where they sought help and solidarity. From 1954 to 1960, Vietnam's unions had over 300,000 members and greatly contributed to building a social society in North Vietnam. They continued building relationships with international unions and strengthening the Marxist-Leninist education of workers in Vietnam. Meanwhile, in the south of Vietnam in 1959, there were about 1.5 million unemployed people. Instead of dealing with this rampant unemployment, the public government launched many programs to try to divide the working class, spreading anti-communist propaganda. Despite all of their effort, hundreds of thousands of workers kept striking and protesting all over the south, especially in big cities such as Saigon, Hue and Da Nang. And then, war broke out between North Vietnam and the USA and its southern puppet regime. During the war from 1960 to 1975, workers' movements still remain very strong across all Vietnam. In the north, union members work on building factories, making weapons and sending supplies to support people in the south. Meanwhile, southern workers kept fighting against imperialism and raised class consciousness every day, and northern and southern unionized workers show great solidarity with each other. The Vietnam War ended in 1975, and Vietnam won and gained our freedom and independence. But this was not really a very happy time because Vietnam was totally destroyed and devastated. Our infrastructure was bombed into the Stone Age. Unexploded bombs were littered all over the nation. Agent Orange poisoned our land and our people, and many Vietnamese workers were disabled by the war and bombing. Comprehensive embargoes from the USA made everything even worse. The workers and unions of Vietnam at that time had a very arduous mission of rebuilding our country from literally nothing. After the war, unions in Vietnam became increasingly strong. They built thousands of factories and dozens of power generators all over the country. Despite all this hardship, Vietnam's economy kept growing and became more stable. During this time, our biggest ally and trading partner was the Soviet Union. We relied on them a lot during the harsh embargoes from the capitalist world. But by the 1980s, it became clear that the Soviet Union were weakening from within and would not last long. The war against Pol Pot and Khmer Rouge at that time made everything even worse. So from 1986 to 1995, Vietnam began implementing the Doi Mới reforms. The Doi Mới reforms were a complicated period of innovation and restructuring. You can learn a little bit about it in my video Is Vietnam Socialist? And I hope to do a video about Doi Mới reforms specifically in the near future. But the long story short is that Vietnam opened a socialism-oriented market economy and allowed the private sector to grow in Vietnam so that the embargoes would end and we could kickstart our infrastructure rebuilding efforts. Vietnam's unions now face a different challenge of assisting Vietnam in dealing with the economic crisis while simultaneously protecting the rights of the workers in the private sector. In 1994, the first labor code of Vietnam was approved and Vietnam's system of unions officially became a part of the government and was placed in charge of protecting labor rights for every worker in Vietnam. Nowadays, Vietnam has a unique union system. The very first thing we need to understand is that we call the whole union system in Vietnam the Vietnam Union. The Vietnam Union is not a specific organization. It is just a general term for our union system. The reason why this matters is that the union system of Vietnam is actually a part of our political system, just like the Supreme Court and the National Assembly. 
So when we refer to the Vietnam Union, again, we aren't talking about a specific organization. It's just the name of the union system that is woven into the fabric of our political system. This is much different from most other countries. So it's important for you to understand that before we move on. So one last time, the Vietnam Union is not an organization. It is just the name of the union system that is an important part of Vietnam's political system. Okay, so within the Vietnam Union system, the Vietnam Zero Confederation of Labor is the leading organization of this system. The Vietnam Zero Confederation of Labor was originally founded as the Red Union all the way back in 1999. This is a little confusing because this is the leading body of a confederation of smaller unions which are confederated together. So you can think of the Vietnam General Confederation of Labor as a union of unions within the Vietnam Union. I know that's a little confusing, but I think it will become more clear as we discuss the national structure of the Vietnam Union, which again is not a union but a system of unions. The Vietnam Union is the largest political social structure of the working class of Vietnam and also has the largest membership. To compare, the Communist Party of Vietnam has about 5 million members, but the unions that make up the Vietnam Union have about 11 million members. But you don't have to be a member of a union to benefit from the Vietnam Union, because our union system offers protection and benefits to every single worker in Vietnam, regardless of whether they hold membership or not. The Vietnam Union system is officially a part of the Vietnam political system. However, it's important to note that our unions are independent from the Communist Party of Vietnam and the government itself. That said, Vietnam Union members do work closely with the Communist Party and the government and observe government and party activity and apply pressure to improve the conditions for workers. Unions in Vietnam are democratic organizations, and every member has the right to vote for their leaders and other important positions within the system. And again, unions in Vietnam are not under control of the Communist Party or the Vietnam government. And actually, sometimes, Vietnam unions hold the Communist Party accountable and put pressure on the government to assist the working class. For example, last year, in January of 2020, Vietnam Union leaders insisted that the Communist Party do more to address corruption within the party and made it clear that the union would implement solutions for corruption. Vietnam Union members saw the problems within the Communist Party and publicly stood up and spoke out against those problems. During those talks, Dr. Pham Đức Kiên, member of the Ho Chi Minh National Political Institute Union, said that the Communist Party of Vietnam needs to move back towards the core values of the Communist Party and to do more to serve the working class, and should not separate the Communist Party from the working class. So you can see that the Vietnam Union is strong enough to publicly stand up to the Communist Party and point out problems it sees. The Vietnam Union also puts pressure on the government. For instance, the union system is instrumental in pressuring the government to increase our minimum wage every single year, usually close to double the rate of inflation. So as you can see, the Vietnam union system is very powerful. But besides putting pressure on the government, what does the Vietnam union actually do? The Vietnam union system has three main functions. First, it represents and protects the rights and interests of the working class of Vietnam. Second, it takes part in the management of the government and social economy. It also observes the government and economic organizations with the welfare of the working class in mind. Third, it educates and encourages workers to promote their ownership of the country, fulfill citizenship obligations, and build and defend the country. So those are the missions of the Vietnam Union system. And now let's talk about the structure of unions in Vietnam. All unions in Vietnam are independently managed, and all unions are independent from the party and the government. There are four levels of unions in Vietnam, but it's not a strict hierarchy. The higher levels work directly with the National Assembly to develop labor laws and work with the National Communist Party to protect the interests of the working class. The higher levels develop strategies and give guidance, but they do not directly control lower levels unions. So that said, let's take a look at the organizational structure of the Vietnam Union system. First, as I mentioned earlier, the leading organization of the Vietnam Union is the Vietnam General Confederation of Labor. 
The Vietnam General Confederation of Labor works on behalf of the working class to take part in managing the economy, monitoring the government, and writing laws and policies related to labor. They also examine and monitor the operation of the government. They organize cultural and educational programs for the working class. The second level of our union structure, just below the Vietnam Confederation of Labor, are the local, regional, and industrial unions. These include provincial unions, municipal federations of labor, national industrial unions, and other such unions. They represent workers in their geographical or industrial sectors to protect workers' rights and to make sure that all labor laws will be implemented properly at the regional level. They also join with other governmental organizations to monitor labor law implementation in their area. They also hold education programs to educate workers and also hold many sporting events for the working class. The third level of our union structure includes federations of labor for district towns and cities, local industrial unions, trade unions of industrial zones, export processing zones, economic zones, high-tech zones, and the trade union of certain corporations. Unions at this level apply and implement labor laws as well as union policies they receive from higher levels. They work closely with local governments on issues related to workers within the area or their industrial zones. They also help explain laws to the workers, instruct lower-level unions about how to implement the law properly, and also monitor the implementation of the labor laws. Finally, they train and educate union members. And the last level includes grassroots trade unions and syndicates. This is the lowest but also the most important level of unions because this level works directly with the workers at most businesses and protects the rights of workers at specific companies and factories. They directly fight against corruption and have workers in legal situations. They also report to higher level of unions to inform them about the actual situation of their workplace. It's written in the law that any new business which has at least five workers who are already union members or who want to join a worker union must immediately establish a worker union within six months of operation. If after six months the business still hasn't established a union, the third level of union has the right to appoint a provisional trade union executive committee to protect workers in that business. Once the union is established, the workers themselves vote for the leaders of their unions, then file some simple paperwork to the local government, and voila, a grassroots worker union is formed. One more very interesting point, to protect better women's rights, we also have a public women's committee working as a secondary power structure within our union system. Every union has the right to have a public women's committee if they have more than 10 female union members. If there are less than 10 female members, one of those female members must be chosen to be in charge of holding special programs for female workers for that unit of the union. So, women have their own internal power structure to see to their own interests within the workplace and this structure is also expanding quickly. We plan that by 2023, Vietnam we have a public women's committee in every single state-owned business and in about 60% of unions in the private sector. Nowadays, Vietnam has about 15 million industrial workers and about 11 million of them are official union members. As for the 4 million workers, well, first of all, the Vietnam Zero Confederation of Labor is always trying to recruit more industrial workers to join the unions. And also, the Zero Confederation of Labor and any applicable lower level unions will always protect any worker even if they are not a member. In fact, any member can go to the union at any time for help if they feel they are being mistreated or if they think the employer is breaking labor laws and their identity will be kept completely confidential. But it's also very interesting to note that most workers in Vietnam don't even have an employer at all. In fact, most workers in Vietnam are self-employed. See, there are four main work sectors in Vietnam. Private sector, state-owned sector, self-employed sector, and cooperative members. First, let's talk about self-employed workers in Vietnam. 84% of self-employed people, or about 8.1 million people total, are members of cooperatives in Vietnam. Cooperatives in Vietnam are very interesting and unique, and soon I will do a video diving into them in detail. But for now, just know that right now, most cooperative members are in agriculture and own their own little farms in the countryside and work cooperatively in their communities. 
Actually, my mom does this, and even I have a 500 square meter of rice farm that the government gave me for free when I was born, like most rural farmers in Vietnam. But anyway, that's 8.4% of workers in Vietnam. So that leaves 47.2% of workers in Vietnam who are self-employed. Which wouldn't surprise you if you ever come to Vietnam and walk through almost any neighborhood. Most of our little retail shops and restaurants and coffee shops are sole proprietorship or family-owned businesses. About 200,000 of these workers are actually contract workers or freelancers. And we will talk more about this later. But as you can see, more than a half of Vietnamese workers are self-employed, either through a cooperative or sole proprietorship or family business and so on. Okay, Phew. that covers self-employed workers. Next, we have state-owned enterprises in Vietnam, which employed about 8.3% of workers. Only about 36% of workers in Vietnam are employed by capitalists. And about 84% of Vietnamese workers work for foreign-owned enterprise, and other 27.6% work for Vietnamese-owned companies. And by the way, every Vietnamese business, whether Vietnamese-owned or foreign-owned, must pay a union fee for each employee, regardless of whether the employee is a union member or not. Workers who choose to become union members must also pay dues, but only if they are employed. Unemployed union members maintain the union membership status but do not have to pay dues as long as they are unemployed. But employers pay for the majority of the union's budget, not union members. Now let's talk about the grassroots unions in Vietnam. We have a total of 126,516 grassroots unions located all over Vietnam and organized within the Vietnam Zero Confederation of Labor. 80,000 of these unions are in the state-owned sector and 46,000 are in the private sector. And these numbers are growing very fast every year. So, the most important role of unions in Vietnam is to enforce and protect workers according to labor laws and workers' rights. This is our most recent updated labor law. It was written in 2019 and it is now completed and went into effect in January 2021. Obviously, I won't read the entire code to you. But importantly, you should know that Vietnamese workers have the right to freely choose an occupation, suffer no discrimination or sexual harassment in the workplace, be provided with personal protective equipment and work in a safe and healthy environment take statutory sick leave and vacation and receive welfare. Workers also have the right to refuse to work if they feel in danger. And of course, we have the right to join a union and go on strike. More on that in a bit. But first, let's talk a little more about worker protections in Vietnam. Let's talk about insurance. Every full-time worker in Vietnam must be covered by three kinds of insurance. The fees for this insurance are mostly paid by the employing company, but the employee must contribute some as well. They are social insurance equal to 25.5% of employees pay, companies pay 17.5%, workers pay 8%. Health insurance equal to 4.5% of the employees pay, companies pay 3%, workers pay 1.5%. And unemployment insurance equal to 2% of the workers pay, company pay 1% and workers pay 1%. So, the total insurance fee for each worker is 32% of the salary, in which company pays 21.5% and workers only have to pay 10.5%. One of the most important purposes of having social insurance is to have maternity and paternity leave when workers have children or adopt children who are under 6 months old. Vietnam has really zero maternity and paternity leave rights. The basic requirement for workers to receive maternity or paternity leaves is that they have to pay social insurance for at least 6 months before having or adopting children. Basically, working mothers can take up to 6 months off with full salary and mothers also receive a one-time allowance equal to 2 months of basic salary for each child they have. Working mothers can also have one hour off every day with full salary until their children are over 12 months old. One more fun fact, when we are menstruating, female workers can leave the workplace 30 minutes earlier and still take home our food salary. As for maternity leave, working fathers who just had children or adopted under 6 month old children can take a leave from 7 up to 14 days with food salary, of course. And also, they will receive a one-time allowance equal to 2 months of basic salary for every child they have. 
Vietnam also has a really good unemployment insurance system. I know because I've gotten unemployment benefits myself. Whenever a worker loses or quits a job, they just have to bring the termination or resignation letter and uh, their insurance record book to the labor department at the local district and they will receive 60% of their salary for 3 months. We just have to report to the Department of Labor once per month, but we are guaranteed that money as long as we are still unemployed. It's as simple as that. So, those are some highlights of how insurance works in Vietnam. Obviously, our insurance system is really complicated and I guess sooner or later I will do a whole video on insurance in Vietnam, but for now, let's leave it at that. Now, let's talk about overtime. According to our labor law, workers can only work overtime a maximum of 30 hours a month and 200 hours a year. Though in some specific industries, overtime is capped at 300 hours per year, and employers had to get permission from the Department of Labor to make workers work overtime at all. Let's compare Vietnam's overtime to other nations in our region. Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and Laos respectively have made it. Laos 45 hours per month, Indonesia 56 hours, Singapore 72 hours, Malaysia 104, Thailand allows 144 hours of overtime per month, and Cambodia and the Philippines set no overtime cap at all. For more comparison, Vietnam's max of 2 to 300 hours overtime is much less than Bangladesh with a maximum of 408 hours per year of overtime, as well as China's uh, 432 hours and holy shit, the capitalist darling country of South Korea allows 624 hours of overtime per year, more than double what Vietnam allows any worker to work overtime per year. Okay, next topic, minimum wage. Generally speaking, Vietnam raises minimum wage every year as you can see on this chart. And that's thanks to the work of the Vietnam General Confederation of Labor, which applies pressure to the government every year to raise the minimum wage as much as possible. I did some math and it shows that Vietnam increases the minimum wage by about 5% or more every year, which is almost double the average rate of inflation. Now, looking at those numbers, you might think that our minimum wage is super low compared to your countries, but income alone doesn't tell the whole story. We do have a lower minimum wage than most developed countries, but we also have a much lower cost of living. It is hard to show this in simple statistical terms, but first, consider that Vietnam has a lot of social welfare safety nets in place, and other material conditions that make things easier for Vietnamese workers. 90% of Vietnamese people own their own homes. If you own your own home, obviously you don't have to pay rent, which in most countries is a huge monthly expense. Also, 89.6% of our people have full health insurance coverage, which poor workers receiving healthcare totally for free. We also have fresh and cheap food easily available in pretty much every community, including wet markets in the middle of the biggest and most dense cities. We also have many price stabilization programs to make sure that the price of rice, meat, medicine, and other staples are always affordable even to poor people. If you want to know more about this, I made two videos about rice, rice stabilization, and poor people's kitchen. Links are in the description. But what this means is that we have one of the lowest malnutrition death rates in the world, at just 0.02%, 45 times less than the malnutrition death rate of the USA. The poverty rate in Vietnam is only 2.7%, and the Vietnam government expects to fully eliminate the extreme poverty within 5 years. You may be asking, what's the definition of poverty used here? Well, the Vietnam government uses two criteria to define poverty, they are income and lack of access to basic social services. A person is considered to be in poverty if they make less than 2 million dong per month in cities and 1.5 million dong in rural areas, or if they lack any 4 of the 12 criteria you see on your screen. So anyway, while our minimum wage might seem low, there is more to the story than just income alone when trying to understand the working class of Vietnam. Now, what about unemployment? Vietnam has one of the lowest unemployment rates in the world. The unemployment rate of Vietnam is usually about 2% every year. Last year in 2020, due to COVID-19, our unemployment rate increased slightly up to 2.73%, uh, but now it has gone down to 2.37%. For comparison, take a look at the USA, where unemployment increased drastically 
up to 14.8% last year and is now down to 6%. But remember, COVID-19 is still killing thousands of people in the US every day. Meanwhile, in Vietnam, COVID is completely contained. So, working in Vietnam isn't nearly as dangerous when it comes to the COVID-19 as it is in most Western countries. These are just some indicators, and obviously, there are still poor people in Vietnam and conditions aren't wonderful across the board. But I have to say that they are improving quickly and I have seen incredible progress in my lifetime, especially in the last 10 years. From 2012-2020, the average monthly salary in Vietnam has more than doubled from 3 million dong to over 7 million dong. Though, there's been a slight decrease lately due to COVID, but not nearly as bad as in most countries in the world. Okay, enough boring statistics. Now, let's talk about the fun stuff. The worker strikes in Vietnam. Every year, there are between about 200 and 300 major worker strikes all over Vietnam, and 82% of these strikes take place at foreign-owned companies. Okay, I lied. Maybe there will be a few more statistics. <laughs> Most worker strikes didn't actually follow the labor law. Theoretically, if workers want to strike, they have to discuss the strike with their unions and then have to ask for permission from the local government. But in reality, most of the time workers don't bother with any of that and have a white cat strike without permission from anyone. If they don't agree with the company's policies or they are pissed off, they just gather together and strike. Because Vietnamese people just don't give a fuck. It's also interesting to note that when the white cat strikes occur, the government actually punishes the local unions for not having the workers. So I'm confident to say that. Workers in Vietnam strike all the time and they don't meet any violence or oppression from either the police nor the government. Oh, and I'm sure that some of you might mention the protests against the former South factory in Vietnam in 2016. Let me tell you this, this was not just a normal worker strike, this was a protest with a political purpose. Thousands of people protested in that event, not just workers, but there were only two people, the protest leaders, who were sent to prison. Why? Because investigators found evidence proving that they were Asian provocators working closely with anti-communist terrorist groups based outside of Vietnam and they just used the situation at the Formosa factory to create chaos and violence in the protests. This is a topic for another video, but I thought I should mention it briefly since it's the only example I could find for violence breaking out with any kind of union worker activity. In the year 2020, from just January to May, there were 91 worker strikes in Vietnam, mostly due to stagnant production because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as soon as the strikes occurred, trade unions cooperated with authorities to settle disputes and satisfy legitimate employee requests, prompting them to resume work. According to the Vice Standing Resident of Vietnam's General Confederation of Labor, so, as you can see, to protect workers' rights, to prevent escalation, and to settle the situation as fast as possible, local union departments always come to every strike to listen to the workers and then help them negotiate with their employers. Here are some examples of successful worker strikes in Vietnam. In 2008, about 15,000 workers in a shoe factory in Vietnam run by a Taiwanese company went on strike. They were partnered for the Nike brand. Yes, the f***ing Nike factory that anti-communists are always going on about. It's actually an example of organized labor succeeding of the working people of Vietnam. The workers at the Taiwanese Nike factory asked for a 20% raise in salary and better lunches. After a few days of striking, the company agreed to raise the salary by 10% and offer higher quality free lunches to all workers. In 2017, 6,000 workers in a textile company in my hometown, Tanghua, went on strike. They had 16 demands for the company, and they also wanted the company to fire four men who had insulted workers who were ethnic minorities. After two days of striking, the company agreed to fire that four men and agreed to meet 10 of the 16 demands. The workers then agreed to go back to work. Last year in 2020, 5,000 workers in Luxshare factory, a factory that produced accessories for Apple, went on strike. Workers wanted their factory to rearrange the working shifts, pay over time, offer allowance for hard tasks and toxic work environments, improve the quality of company's restroom and medical centers. On the third day of the strike, 
The company agreed to pay them two months of back pay that the company still owed their workers, and also agreed to many other requests such as one more free meal for workers who work overtime, overtime pay, a better variety of medicine in the company's medical centers, longer maternity leave, and many other concessions. Unfortunately, the union system still has some problems that need to be solved. For example, let's take a look at Grab. Grab is one of the biggest transportation companies in Vietnam. You can think of it like Uber. It's a ride-share service where you can book a car or a motorbike to take you around town, and they also do uh, deliveries. Grab entered Vietnam in 2014 and quickly became the leading ride-share service. In fact, it was so successful here that they even bought out Uber. Over the years, their policies for drivers, both motorbikes and cars, have been getting worse and worse. Grab drivers have gone on strike several times every year since 2017 due to bad policies and low payments to drivers. The latest strike just happened in December 2020, even though thousands of Grab drivers from Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City joined this strike, their demands were never met. This is because, technically, Grab drivers are not employees, they are subcontractors of Grab. They didn't sign labor or employment contract with the company, Instead, they signed the partner contract. This is very similar to the problem freelancers and gig economy workers are facing around the world, and unfortunately, Vietnam's labor system still hasn't caught up to addressing this issue, which sucks for workers like Grab drivers. Because of this technicality, our unit system cannot help them. Until now, there's still no law to protect them yet. The Grab company clearly found a leak in our labor law, and they are using that against the drivers. There is some potential good news for Grab drivers though. The 2019 Labor Code. As I mentioned earlier, the big change we made to our Labor Code in 2019, we changed the way our union system works considerably. And this will go into effect this year in 2021. According to our new Labor Code, starting sometime this year in 2021, workers will be able to form their own worker representative organizations in their workplace. These WROs are independent from the unions and each WRO is limited to protect workers at a single company. Though a single company can have many WROs if the workers decide to form them. But WROs are much different from Vietnamese unions. Remember, in Vietnam, unions are political organizations for the working class, while WROs are just not. They don't really have political power beyond the company they are in. They can be used by workers to go on strike, to demand changes in the workplace, to initiate a collective bargaining, but those changes are all limited to the single company where the WRO was formed. Personally, I'm skeptical of WROs in Vietnam. The main reason why Vietnam agreed to allow WROs is because of pressure from foreign capitalist nations. See, in March 2018, Vietnam signed a comprehensive and progressive agreement for Chance Pacific Partnership with 10 other Pacific Rim nations such as Australia, Canada, Japan, and New Zealand. And also in June 2019, Vietnam signed the Free Trade Agreement with European countries. Both of these agreements require Vietnam to have independent worker representative organizations. Now, at first glance, it seems like obviously a good thing for Vietnam to accept independent WROs, right? But if you look at it from our perspective, unions in Vietnam are already very strong. Almost every Vietnamese person I know personally is very satisfied with the union system here, and I am really happy with it myself. In truth, I'm really skeptical about this new development of WROs. First of all, why would foreign capitalist nations pressure Vietnam to have them? Do you think foreign companies who want to build factories in Vietnam and trade with us really care about workers in Vietnam? I myself am skeptical of any pressure that comes from countries like Australia, Canada, Japan, New Zealand, and uh, pretty much anywhere in Europe, given the track record of foreign intervention and trade pressure on Vietnam. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out my video, Is Vietnam Socialist? Link is in the description. Here is my concern. Allowing independent workers' organization can be easily corrupted and controlled by capitalists, just like unions in hyper-capitalist countries. Just look at the unions in the USA and how weak and corrupt most of them have become. 
Even more worrying, it's possible that foreign-funded anti-communists who have spent decades trying to sabotage Vietnam might more easily influence these smaller independent organizations. WROs in Vietnam can more easily be manipulated and weaken our existing unions in Vietnam and to allow capitalist propagandists to spread disinformation through these organizations. This is why the Vietnam government made the decision to not allow these WROs to have any political power. I personally think this was a good decision because, again, I myself am very wary about this development and I'm quite skeptical of these new WROs. That said, the WROs could have a positive benefit, so let's not just too quickly. Remember when I was talking about Grab, the ride share company that's like Uber? With these new WROs, it's possible that Grab drivers might be able to start their own workers' representative organization to protect their rights and close up to loophole about unions for contractors. According to Mr. Nguyen Khak Zhang, an expert with the Vietnam Institute for Economic and Policy Research, Uber and Grab drivers should be able to work together to form an independent worker organization. Mr. Zhang also urged the government to come up with new policies to protect the rights of these drivers and other contract workers. He also said freelancers in Vietnam should also benefit from being able to form WROs. It remains to be seen if this strategy will be effective and how much WROs will help grab drivers and freelancers and other workers in Vietnam. But I would try to be cautiously optimistic and hope for the best. Time will tell. As things develop, I will be sure to keep you updated here on my channel. Well, that's pretty much all I have to say for now about labor in Vietnam. It's obvious that there are still many problems that need to be fixed here. And Vietnam is very far from perfect. But if you look at my country from a comprehensive and historical viewpoint, I hope you can see how much progress we have been making over the years. As I said, I'm making this channel to not persuade you that my country, Vietnam, is perfect nor anything close to it. I just want to provide you with my perspective. As a Vietnamese communist living in Vietnam, I try to give you the information as accurately as possible, the good points and the bad points, so you can draw your own conclusions. I just want you to look at us as what we really are, with our own failures and mistakes, but also achievements. And maybe those lessons can help you to improve your own home country in the future. I will keep making videos on Vietnam to try to answer all of your questions. And I live stream every Tuesday night from 11 p.m. Eastern US time. So if you want to ask me questions, just go to my stream every week. So please stay tuned, subscribe, and maybe join my Patreon. Oh, and one more important announcement. My Vietnam Master of Learning textbook translation will be finished in just a few weeks. Ebook will be totally free online, and if you want to support me by buying hard copies, please email me at lunaoi.channel at gmail. Subject, book order. I will try to sell those hard copies as cheaply as possible. Again, thank you so much for the support. Bye!